thank you for tuning into my Q&A this week. Uh, the questions I'm going to go over in uh, this Q&A are on uh, comping patterns if you're comping yourself when you're singing or if you're playing with a singer or a horn player. Uh, I'm going to go over if you have problems with your hands, if you have like uh, wrist issues or hand issues. Uh, and um, I'm also going to cover, finally, auxiliary dominance because everybody keeps asking me about it. And um, actually coming a little bit out of that, I'm also going to take a look at uh, a chord progression from the rhythm changes with some really annoying or at least strange uh, diminished chord choices. Remember that if you have a question for one of these Q&A videos, then uh, leave a comment on this video or send me a message on Facebook or uh, via uh, email, Instagram, uh, Snapchat. All those places are sort of easy, um, easy to reach for questions. Uh, if you want to help me continue making all these videos with the lessons and the Q&As, then uh, subscribe to my channel and uh, like this video on YouTube. And of course, if you really want to help me get some more time, uh, visit my web store and see if there's something that you can use. And then that way you can sort of directly help me get more time to work on the channel and all the lessons. Since I'm anyway experimenting with what I put on the channel and uh, the type of content I'm using, I was actually thinking about uh, starting to post some stuff of me practicing, uh, mostly because I mean I do make videos where I'm playing over backing tracks and I also post the backing tracks, uh, and that's kind of fun to do. But um, most of the time when I'm practicing, I'm actually used just playing with a metronome, uh, and I record that sometimes for myself just to sort of figure out how I'm doing because that's a really huge part of how I work. Uh, so I I record it just to check my timing and the phrasing and look at it a little bit later and stuff like that, and that's something that I find very useful to do. And I can actually also post some of these, uh, but they're of course a little bit hard to follow because there's no backing track, it's just a metronome, if there is a metronome. Uh, so they might be more vague. Um, what do you guys think? Is that something I should post? Uh, and is that something you guys want to see? And, and of course it can open up for a lot of discussions because if you know the songs you can always ask what I'm doing in certain places or how I approach things. So in that way it can also open up some more stuff for these Q&As or on those videos themselves. Uh, let me know in the comments. Uh, and then we'll see what I, I'll try it out a few times, I think, because I have quite a few of them uh, made in poor quality on my phone, of course, but uh, let's just see what happens. Let's get to the questions. Talking about health, have you had carpal tunnel syndrome or some problems with your hands' tendons? So if you have pain in your hands, or especially in, in your, well, left hand, if you're a right-handed player, uh, while you're playing, then I think the first thing you want to do is actually to seek medical uh, help. So uh, go see somebody who can tell you what is exactly going on, because if you don't know what you have, then you can't really fix it. Uh, so I think it's important to really get a good uh, diagnosis and, and, and figure out what it is. Um, just to talk about how I did have issues with my hands once, but it's a really long time ago, uh, because that was uh, the year before I uh, did an entrance exam at the conservatory. And um, for the rest, I've been really lucky. I think also given how I sit and, and how I work, uh, I'm quite lucky not to have more issues with my hands and also not to have more issues with my back. Um, so for that I'm just a horrible example. And, um, and I'm not really going to say much more about, about it and give advice on it because I don't think I'm a really good example of it and um, I don't know really how to give you any really useful advice because I didn't really have to solve so many problems with it. But I can actually help you still because um, a friend of mine uh, is a guitar player in Boston called uh, Jake uh, Esner and um, he went through a lot of problems at some point and uh, he really figured it out and he really sort of uh, addressed everything and uh, was really thorough in checking out how you sit and how you play uh, and he made a video on this and I'll link to it uh, as a card but also in the description and I would say even if you're not having problems with your hands uh, this is food for thought, at least for me it was really something that I watched and thought, well, okay, I actually learned something from this and, and, and it made me aware of how I play and some things that I can think about in terms of getting my technique better uh, and more efficient and more healthy. So uh, for that I would say that's worthwhile for uh, anybody to check out. I think he didn't make it public, but the link is there so you can still check it out. Uh, and I think it's an extremely good video, so, um, so it's well worthwhile checking out. For the rest, uh, yeah, seek medical help. Make, make, be sure that you know what, what you're sort of fighting against. If it's just like uh, you overused your arm or your fingers or something, and um, uh, if you really have some other medical condition, then maybe there's a treatment. So, yeah, that's, the, that's an important thing to do. Make sure that when you play that you take enough rest. Um, this is something that also I was uh, talking to Jake about this 
the uh, email and uh, he mentioned that the important thing is to make sure that every 30 minutes you have a 5 minute break and you can always do something else I mean, I actually I think that's also there's like this motivational thing where you uh, get more out of your work time if you take regular breaks something that I'm also not very good at but um, uh, but it is actually, that's also actually true. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, so try and do that. Uh, check out the video that I'm linking to. It's, it's worthwhile, even if you have no problems with your hands. And um, uh, I don't know, maybe also ask in the comments if you want to have more information, because I think it's uh, it's an important subject. It's a it's a problem for a lot of people, uh, and there are a lot of things. I know I've changed some things with my technique, but it's all in that video from Jake, and he does he explains it much better than me. So I'm not really going to go into it here. You can check out that video. Um, so yeah, and I hope you get through it. Could you explain the use of secondary dominance? Perhaps as many examples as you'd like. It's a new topic to me which really interests me and is something I want to learn. Thanks. I love this channel. So this question on auxiliary dominance and the, how you use them is something that I get asked very, very often and uh, I think get it almost once a week. Uh, and there's not really a lot to it. Uh, I think the, the best way to work with auxiliary dominance is just to understand how they work in a song and how they work in a progression. As with any chord, you want to know how it works in a progression. So if we look at, um, just for simplicity's sake, let's take a C major scale. So C major would have these diatonic chords. So all of them would be like C major, D minor, E minor 7, F major 7, G7, A minor, B half diminished, and then C. Uh, and there's only one dominant, and the dominant is of course G7, and G7 is what we're using. So if we want to have a really strong a chord that, that really is going to pull us back to C, sort of for the ending of the song or something like this, then we use the, the G7, so that will be... And I think that's kind of clear, you can hear here that, that that's really resolving, and, and uh, that the point of this chord in this key is to just to move to this C major chord. But if we want to go to another chord in the key, we only have that one dominant, and it's only going to resolve to, to C, actually. Uh, but you can actually just add uh, dominance to all the other chords as well. So if, I, if I'm in C, and I want to go to D minor, then I can add an A7, because that's the dominant of D minor. And I can go on and go back to C. So, and that works for all of the chords, really. So that way I can just add anywhere that I, I want to. Of course this has to fit, if you're playing a song you have to fit it with the melody. So if the melody is, is not something that, that's going to work with the dominant chord then it doesn't work. But uh, for the rest you can just use, you can actually add an uh, auxiliary dominant anywhere you want to. You have to watch out with where you put it in terms of the harmonic rhythm sometimes. Uh, but uh, if you just check out a lot of standards, you'll find lots of examples of uh, auxiliary dominance. It's, it's not so, um, it's not really that tricky. Uh, the video I made where I'm analyzing all of me, because all of me has a lot of auxiliary dominance. I mean, uh, that's also in C. So it starts in C, then you get the dominant for A minor, so that's an A7, and then you get the dominant. It doesn't resolve to A minor, it goes to A7, because it leads on to D minor. So we get a auxiliary dominant to A minor auxiliary dominant to D minor, and then we get the D minor. You can check out that video, that's, that's kind of how that works. Um, I think that's, that's also the way you have to think about it. I don't think you want to work about work too much on sort of substituting things with, with the auxiliary dominance. They're there in the song or they're not there. Um, and if, if you want to learn how to use them as a composer, uh, I think it's the same as, as with many other things. Uh, find examples of other people using it and learn from that. Uh, and, and see how that works and see if you can sort of make that fit in your progressions. I think that's the way to approach that. So uh, so that's what they are and how they sit in the harmony. Um, the other thing that uh, was, a, was a question is how to play over them. And actually that's also fairly simple. If we take our C major scale, um, we can, as I just showed, you can have an auxiliary dominant to any chord in the scale, pretty much. I didn't go over all of them, but you can probably imagine that that will work. Uh, otherwise, just try it out, you can hear it. So we have our C major scale, and we can, of course, have an um, 
auxiliary dominant everywhere, and we can split the notes in this scale, or the chords in this scale, into two. Uh, those that are major chords and those that are minor chords. Uh, and that's actually all you need to know. In tonal music you don't really need to know. There are no sort of really weird scales that you're going to be putting to use um, on the dominance, necessarily. There's like in, in jazz there's one habit, but, and I'll just talk about that, there's like an exception. But um, for the rest it's, it's quite simple. So um, if we have a D minor chord in the key of C and we have an auxiliary dominant that's going to resolve to the D minor, then the natural choice of scale is of course a D minor scale that has an A7. And that uh, the most effective one is the A harmonic minor. Uh, sorry, D harmonic minor. Uh, because that has the A7 flat 9. So, so that's the scale you're going to use. So whenever you have a dominant resolving to a minor chord, and the same will go for, for E minor, so the natural choice of scale here. If we take F, then the the scale we would use here is just F major on the C7. Um, so yeah, so so if it's a major chord that it resolves to, you would use the major scale, or like a major type dominant. Um, so that means that for F and G, you would be using like a C7 with a 13 and a 9, so it's F major or <coughs> On a G7, uh, or the, the D7 leading to the G7, you would also use basically G uh, major. And then A minor would of course be A minor harmonic and so on and so forth. It's simple really. You look at the chord it's resolving to, or supposed to resolve to, and then you take that scale. So, um, so you have two choices, major and harmonic uh, minor for the dominant. Then there's one exception, and I think that exception is coming out of um, a habit in jazz. I don't think it's actually sort of something that we can talk about in, in terms of really being sort of theory uh, related. I think it's much more of a habit. But that is that in, in major, when you're in a major key, uh, you have the dominant of the dominant appearing quite often. And um, the dominant of the dominant we tend to use it, and actually this is something that I'm sort of taking out of having listened listen to a lot of records and uh, also especially having listened to a lot of uh, music minus one like Abersold records and stuff like that. The dominant of the dominant, nine out of ten times when people play that in major they'll use uh, um, a sharp eleven. So that means that if you're in the key of, uh, uh, of C, again still, and we have sort of the typical cadence, for instance if we have a song that's 32 bars the typical cadence at the middle would be like... So we get A minor 7, D7, D minor 7, G7. And I would still consider A minor 7, D7 as a dominant of the dominant, even though it doesn't directly go to the G7, because it just goes to D minor 7. But if it leads to the dominant in the 2-5, it's like, a, like this is a substitution. Uh, substitution it's a, suspension of the G7, so that way it still feels like it's going to resolve across that. Uh, and then the kind of chord you will hear, and, and you can just go check some episodes or other things, you will hear this all the time. So. Uh, so, so that would be a dominant where we play a sharp 11 and then that's like a Lydian dominant. That's sort of the one exception, and you don't even need, you don't need to do it um, because uh, the the G is anyway in a void note. You won't be playing that really, but um, but it's very often played like that. You'll get used to once you notice, you'll get really used to the sound of it. Also, I think. Um, this is something I didn't talk about. Is that of course when is something an auxiliary dominant? So it's only going to be an auxiliary dominant if it actually resolves. Huh? So so um, sometimes you will have dominance that are not resolving. So if we're in the key of C, then F major, B flat 7 to C. B flat 7 is now resolving to C, it's not a dominant. Huh? So if it's a dominant, it's going to be resolving to E flat. That, then it's an auxiliary dominant. And that's that's kind of how you have to think about it. Because the like the like this is called, this is actually like a 4 minor thing, and it's 
also often referred to as a backdoor dominant, that's not a dominant function. Another one that you quite often come across is like... where the fourth degree is played as a dominant and going back to the tonic, that's also not a dominant in a sense, because it would have to resolve uh, to the tonic where in the in the key where the dominant is actually the fifth degree, and it's of course not the fifth degree in C. Uh, so yeah, so that's that's pretty much it. It's uh, as when it comes to auxiliary dominance, uh, there's not really a lot of stuff to, to talk about with it, um, other than this. And if there's something that you still want to know, well then just uh, ask, leave a comment, and then uh, maybe I can clarify. It. Maybe I can make another answer. But yeah, this is sort of the basic idea about auxiliary dominance. This is all you need to know to understand how they work and what, how to play on them. Dear Jens, I'm a jazz singer and I began to accompany myself on guitar a little bit using simple drop 2 and drop 3 voicings. I was wondering if you could tell a bit about different comping rhythms suitable for a voice guitar setting. I must admit that I haven't seen all of your videos, so if you already posted something on the topic, could you please point me? Thank you very much and all the best. If you're using drop 2 and drop 3 voicings, then you probably have a really good vocabulary for covering most of the chords you're going to come across in standards. Uh, and you also have the root in the bass most of the time, which is very useful, uh, because then you can kind of split up the chords in, in two parts. So we have a bass part and a chord part, or a harmony part. Uh, in a setting, I'm probably going to ignore a little bit that you're singing yourself, because I don't really know how much freedom you want when you're singing, and also um, how, how your ability is to play the guitar in terms of, of what you're able to do. Uh, because you will see people who are able to do quite a lot when they're uh, in terms of playing while they're singing, uh, and I don't know how free they are. And there, there are things there and there that I don't just don't know. Uh, so I'm gonna be a little bit more general about it. I'm gonna try to give you some advice that's also gonna help for other people who are playing in a setting like that where they're playing duo with a horn player or with a, with a singer. So what's happening is, of course, we have the melody being taken care of by uh, somebody else, or uh, we're singing it, and then. Um, the guitar is uh, supplying the whole groove and the harmony. Uh, so those are the two things that we need sort of have happening. And um, I guess the groove part I would consider the most important for the sort of for the whole because if the melody is strong, it will probably give away most of the harmony anyway. So so that's that's the thing we need to find a way to sort of lay down a groove in this setting. Um, so if we're looking at um, uh, different ways of doing that. So let's just do the one that's really complicated and probably that works really well that I use all the time when I'm playing with singers or horn players. Uh, but it's probably kind of hard to do if you're um, if you have to sing at the same time. I'm not going to try, even though that might be amusing. Um, would be to play walking bass and chords, uh, something that I actually published a lesson on uh, a few days ago. Uh, I'll link to that lesson also. You can check that out. So. Um, if I play the song I'm going to be using this on, I think I'm going to do all the examples on Afternoon in Paris just to have some song to do it on. Um, so if I play walking bass and chords on that, that will be something like... And so on and so forth. But of course this is like quite... Uh, it's also maybe a bit fast actually, but it's also something that, that there's a lot happening uh, and it's kind of hard to do something else at the same time. And it can also be, if you, if you don't have to sing at the same time, it can actually be hard to keep up also if you have to play for a longer longer period of time, I know from experience. So there are of course other ways to do it. Here we clearly have this separation of a, a bass note, but then there's a moving bass line uh, and a chord part. But we can also split up if you think of... Um, I guess more like a piano player, if you listen to people accompanying themselves on piano, uh, maybe not necessarily in a jazz way, but, but more like, uh, well, I mean, of course you have all the bossa nova stuff with Joao uh, Schubert, where he's sort of playing some grooves, uh, and that's of course specifically bossa nova, but that's also worthwhile checking out for sure. Um, and then take maybe some of the simpler ones, even though if you hear him play some of the more complicated grooves, he can phrase quite freely on it, so uh, that's also worth checking out anyway. But if we then take it to a more simple thing and then play everything uh, as quarter notes, then we don't split the, the two layers in two. But if we take something more simple and then don't split it in two, then of course we can do um, just like playing Freddie Green fourths. 
So if I play all, uh, afternoon in Paris like that, that could be something like... That's something I do really a lot actually, because I really like to have the two layers, but, but that is definitely an option. Of course you can do it with a pick as well. That's gonna sound um, probably more in style of Freddie Green, but the other thing sounds a little bit more full, I think, if you use your thumb. Um, and that's of course really simple. And then if you check out um, like the kind of rhythm that you would expect from a piano player, because a piano player will play this using two hands and will sort of naturally split those two in some sort of pattern. Uh, and you can experiment with what kind of pattern you, you want to use. Uh, one could be also ju to just say, well, I'm just going to mark some rhythms with the bass once in a while and then just keep the... chords going like this. So I think that's sort of something that's, that, that you can check out. And of course whenever you have, uh, and that will go if you're comping yourself, but also if you're comping other people, uh, if you know the melody and there's a break in the melody, then you can always do more. That, that's how everybody does that also when they're comping themselves, just check, uh, well, if you even check people like Hendrix and, and, and all the, 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 the blues and, and rock guys who are accompanying accompany themselves, they will play the fills, of course, when they're not singing. Uh, and also if you're playing behind somebody else, that's when you want to play fills, of course, because otherwise you're just getting in the way. So I would look for those kind of things, and of course you can do like, now I'm doing the, still the, the swing feel, keeping sort of the quarter note groove going. Um, because I think, for jazz, I don't think that that doesn't sound so nice actually, to have the sort of repeated bass note, so... I think this sort of works better. So, um, and of course you can vary it a bit. And for me it becomes really close to playing actually like Brazilian music, but then keeping it in, in, in a swing feel. Um, and those would be sort of the things I would start with. Um, because you have something conveying, you clearly have something conveying the groove uh, and, and, and then whatever you put up, whatever you have on top in the melody will make much more sense. Um, and, and also it means that you don't have to follow the groove as clearly with, uh, with the melody because there is already a very clear sense of, of groove on it. And of course it takes some time to get it to sound good and get used to it, that depends on your level on guitar also. Um, but if you think of 200 or three voicings, your level shouldn't be that low, I think. So, yeah, I would say give that a go and then uh, see what you can do with it. And, and I think, I mean, in the long run, uh, it's nice to have different ideas. So uh, you can, of course, try and try out different grooves and see if you can figure out. I think whenever you hear a groove and you like the, that groove, try and see if you can reduce the groove to like a high and a low part and then see if you can convert that to guitar. I, I guess I think that like that quite a lot in terms of different types of um, feels and grooves for for, um, for these sort of solo guitar, uh, or not so much solo guitar, but where you're just a guitar laying down the whole thing. Uh, and I'm trying to use that in different ways. Uh, and I think also like a lot of the, well actually some of the better singer-songwriter stuff is really good for this as well. Um, and they have very good ways of, of, of dealing with this. And then you have to still figure out like how they how you take it away from their song and then put it into something like a standard, but uh, I think that's also something that's worthwhile checking out for sure. How would you treat a progression like B flat major seven, B diminished, C minor, C sharp diminished, D minor seven, G seven, C minor seven, F seven? I noticed that kind of substitution is played quite often. I understand that in fact it's just a sub for the one six two five for the most part, but I can't really uh, grasp the meaning of the C sharp diminished and how to approach it. Okay, so this is obviously in the key of B flat. 
as a B-flat major. And uh, I just explained in the other uh, question on the auxiliary dominance, how you can have auxiliary dominance and how they work in a progression. So if we look at this progression, then the G7 is very clearly like an auxiliary dominant to the second degree, to the C minor. So um, that takes care of that. So the last part of this progression is just the 3, 6, 2, 5. And uh, where we use like the auxiliary dominant to go to the 2. Uh, if we look at the first part of it, so especially because the, of course it's the C sharp diminished that's tricky, but if we just look at this, just to get an idea about what's going on actually. If we look at this progression first, so that's B flat, and then we're going with a B diminished to C minor. But this B diminished is of course just the sort of an inversion of the auxiliary dominant that you would have there. So if you would have an auxiliary dominant, then that would be a G7, because that's the dominant of C minor. Uh, and it's a minor chord we're going to, so it would be a, um, a dominant from uh, the harmonic minor scale, so C harmonic minor, the G7 you would find in G, and C harmonic minor, so let's turn this right. Um, and that gives us, of course, also this B diminished, this is also, in fact, diatonic to C minor harmonic. Uh, and if we know that, then I think it's not so difficult to see that, in fact, the C sharp diminished is just there as an A7 leading us to D minor. And um, I guess, so that, that means that when you're playing on it, um, so let's first just take that, so the, when you're playing on it, so the B diminished is just C harmonic minor and the C sharp diminished is just going to be D harmonic minor, because they're both diminished chords that are acting as dominants to the chord that, that follows. Uh, so that's, that's kind of simple, I think. To play, and that also means like playing A7 to D minor is not so difficult. Uh, of course, in this context, we, if you know rhythm, then then uh, rhythm changes, then then you're used to there being being an F7 in this point, um, and then we're trying to relate the C sharp diminished to an F7 as a substitution, and uh, that doesn't actually make any sense. Uh, this is sort of like that. There is this whole problem with people wanting to try to think in substitutions and then not understanding the whole progression because the C sharp diminished there is there as a result of the whole progression. So it's there as a result of the bass line. So the reason why we would use this is only is, is because we are going to D minor. So the D minor has to be there and we're actually moving up chromatically and that's why you want to add that C sharp diminished. And it's in that way not really related to um, to F7. So this is something, I actually made a video on, on this and tried to explain it uh, that I never put out because it's hard to really put it into a good video. Um, but th I think this really important point is that, that you have to look at, if you want to understand a chord, you really have to look at the stuff around it as well. Uh, and and we, we waste a lot of time, and I see people wasting a lot of time and only thinking about substitutions and only thinking about it's this chord they might think about what chord it is in the key, but usually they'll just look at it and go like it's a minor 7 chord, or it's a dominant chord, and then they'll make some choices on that, instead of looking at, well, actually, it's this chord in this key, in this progression. And you can do a ton of things with stuff if you if you work with it from that point of view, um, because you have, much, you have a lot more options than just looking at, okay, this chord, and we have to find something that fits exactly in this place. Uh, and... I mean, you could actually put an F7 at this point in the song, probably depending on the melody also, but um, uh, for sure you cannot use a C sharp diminished whenever you have uh, an F7. So it's not like you can always substitute. It's going to be really context sensitive when you use uh, certain progressions, and it's better to understand them as whole progressions because they're not gonna they're not gonna appear alone really. Um, so you're not gonna have like. Uh, a C sharp diminished instead of an F7 anytime soon, except in situations like this, I think. So, so that, I think that's sort of an important point to, to have also that that it's it's more about understanding the whole progression and then just say looking at what it is and then understanding it like that. Um, and you need the D minor to understand the C sharp diminished in this case. That's, that's for instance a good example of that. Uh, and it seems confusing also because it's very close to like the 
uh, flat three diminished, which I made a video on. And uh, but that actually goes the other way, so that's in that way quite different because this is really dominant, just a dominant. So so much for for ranting on about understanding harmony. Uh, I guess I should just see if I can finish my overview of the functionals, uh, function harmony in jazz standards a bit, so that uh, I could actually sell you guys something instead of uh, just ranting about it in my Q and A's. Um, so when you play on this, uh, I'm pretty much going to assume that the last part is not really a problem to play on because it's just a three six two five, so um, that, that's not so so difficult. So when you have this position, it's um, it's almost like a special effect. So it's the kind of thing where if you do this, the bass players are probably going to go, you know. So so you want to emphasize that. So, so it's okay. I mean, hopefully he won't do it every chorus because it sounds silly if you do if you do it that much. But um, if you hear it coming along, then and you want to jump in on that, then then uh, it's okay to just really use. I mean, in the context like this, you have four notes, four eight notes per chord. Huh? So uh, have some different choices in terms of chord inversions and arpeggio inversions that you can throw at it. I think that that works the best. Uh, so really like the. Those kind of things. So uh, let's see what can we do. So really, just thinking in terms of arpeggio, 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 arpeggio. You know, those, those kind of things. Because because it's like a special effect. I think that's a good way to treat it. I think that it makes sense in in the context. Um, and otherwise. If I had to place something else on it, I would probably look for um, because if it's in a song and it's not like moving and, and you have more time to it to, to for each chord, then then I would just think the dominance really and use that um, to make some some melodies with it, like I would any other chord. Uh, so so, um, so that's not I mean playing a five one even if it's like a harmonic minor dominant, it's not too tricky. I I, I expect. So yeah, so that that's what I think about this, this C sharp diminished, and then even though it's enharmonic to the flat three diminished, it isn't actually. It's a C sharp diminished because it's a an A seven moving up to D minor in this case. I think that's sort of the important uh, clue in this progression. That was some answers to some of the questions that I got from you guys. Uh, I think these videos I I kind of say that almost every week, but I really think these videos are kind of fun to do because I have to think about uh, you guys' questions. Uh, in a different way, and uh, hopefully, uh, I can help you guys a bit with with what I'm answering, and at least it makes me think about things in a different way, which is something I, I find interesting. Uh, remember that if you have a question, then leave a comment on this video, or send me a message on Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat, uh, or send me an email. Of course, that can that works as well. Uh, if you like this video, then please like it here on YouTube. And if you're not already subscribed to my channel, you can of course subscribe to my channel. Uh, and if you really want to help me make more videos and stuff like that, then check out my web store. That's sort of an easy way to help me get more time for my uh, videos and the lessons and all the stuff I'm doing. So uh, that's about it for this week. Uh, there's a new lesson on Thursday, and uh, I'll see you then. Bye.